In this video, we're going to assemble the top levels of Jacobson's judgment. In Osthing's Kookaburra report, it was pointed out that it takes a lot of work to reassemble Jacobson's reasoning from the 60-page judgment. For example, in paragraph 1, where it would make sense to have his judgment, we find a bit of background about the song, that it was composed by Miss Marion Sinclair 1934, etc. To find his judgment, we have to go all the way to paragraph 337. And when we finally reach paragraph 337, we find only the most elementary account of his reasoning. He declares that he has arrived at the view that the 1979 and 1981 recordings of Down Under violate Larrikin's copyright in Kookaburra because both of those recordings reproduce a substantial part of Kookaburra. What he does not do is lay out before us the clear path by which he arrived at this view, nor does he spell out the crucial link to the legal case law, which is that copyright is violated where substantial part of the copyright work is used without permission. This was stated much earlier, but is left implicit at the end. It is stated in paragraph 7, but there it is separated from the main claim. Paragraph 7 invokes the Commonwealth Copyright Act of 1968, saying, in effect, look there to see how copyright is infringed. Paragraphs 8 and 9 say that parts of the situation indicate that it has happened in this case, but again, there is a co-premise only spelled out elsewhere that there is sufficient objective similarity between the two works for the latter to constitute the reproduction of a substantial part of Kookaburra. And so it goes. The reasoning in his judgment is scattered across 50 or 60 pages of background information and commentary, and even when we reassemble the claims, some of the most important ones are implied rather than made explicit. Let's step through what we can see now. Jacobson's judgment is that the 1979 recording and the 1981 recording of Down Under infringe Larrikin's copyright in Kookaburra. Why? Because the 1979 and 1981 recordings of Down Under reproduce a substantial part of Kookaburra, and copyright is infringed where a person without the license of the owner of the copyright reproduces a substantial part of the work. The legal basis for this crucial co-premise or assumption is the Commonwealth Copyright Act of 1968, qualified at paragraph 62 by Russell William Textiles, quote, the copied features must be a substantial part of the copyright work, but they need not be a substantial part of the infringing work, the overall appearance of which may be very different from the copyright work. These two pieces of law have shaped Jacobson's thinking about what constitutes violation of copyright. Why does he believe that the recordings reproduce a substantial part of Kookaburra? Here we are at level 2 of the argument map. Claim 2a. Reproduction within the law of copyright requires an objective similarity between the two works and a causal connection between the plaintiff's work and that of the defendant. This was defined in the case of S.W. Hart and Company Proprietary Limited versus Edwards Hot Water Systems. Note, this is what we called in the earlier video a bedrock citation, bedrock evidence. Secondly, 2b. The causal connection between Kookaburra and Down Under is not disputed by the respondents, and so these first two components are leading in the direction of the judgment that there has been violation of copyright. By causal connection, he means that the original work was familiar to the defendants and they might reasonably be seen as having used it as a model for what they produced. That is, they reproduced it in whole or in part. But crucially, to see, there is sufficient objective similarity between Kookaburra and the 1979 and 1981 recordings of Down Under for the latter to constitute reproduction of a substantial part of the former. This third claim, to see, turns out to be where all the work is done, and yet this statement in its own right is nowhere made explicit. But what is his reason for believing it? As it happens, there are three parts also to this reason, but you have to piece it together from Jacobson's prose. It consists of the following claims. 3b. The first two bars of Kookaburra are used in Down Under. 3c. The first two bars are a substantial part of Kookaburra. And 3d. The use of these two bars in Down Under has sufficient objective similarity to their use in Kookaburra to constitute the reproduction. Again, this assumption, 3d, not the main claim, 3b, is where the burden of the work falls. While Jacobson has one line of reasoning in support of 3d, most of the work that's done in underpinning his judgment is not so much evidence in support of 3D as rebuttals to a whole series of objections to it. Without something like this map, it takes a lot of work to understand even these uppermost levels of his reasoning. But as we shall see, in Jacobson's prose, the rebuttals are not directly connected for the most part to the objections themselves, and they are complex, because they rely upon inference objections to objections.